Hi, I'm John DeArmond with the Coquille Valley Sword Group, and today I thought we would go over some things that you can look for in your own solo practice, in your own kata work, when you're uh, not, you know, really worried about your partner's safety. And I'm thinking that I'll probably break this into several videos, focusing on uh, areas that you can look for to make improvements in your own work. Um, the focus of today's video is going to be on efficiency of motion. In other words, how you can, uh, one, begin to recognize when your motions are not efficient. Uh, two, you can start to look at, well, where's the, where's the threshold between uh, uh, too much movement for the work that I'm doing and too little to be able to accomplish the goal? Uh, so we're going to play with that a bit. Uh, I've got kind of two pieces of work that we're going to use to look at this. Um, the first one is very gross, very uh, big, simple, easy to see. So let's go ahead and start there. Ways that we can um, sort of begin to see where our motions are too big or too much in the wrong place. Uh, we can usually start with our legs and how we walk and how we move. So as you all know, in the kata, if, I'm going to exaggerate my position, if my right foot is forward and I want to go forward, I'm going to step with that right foot first, right? If I want to go back, I'm going to step with that back foot. I'm going to go this way, nine times out of 10, I'm going to step with the leg that's close to where I'm going. There are uh, times where the uh, tactics that you're trying to employ necessitate you uh, using the far leg, such as in Ukanagashi, where we slip to their outside, uh, using the far side leg to get to it. But these tend to be the exception to the rule. Um, we understand why we make our steps this way. We understand that if I'm at cutting distance with the dude or, or just outside of it, sort of half step or one step, and I go to move with that long step, <clears throat> he's got all the time to start working on me. And when he starts to work, he's gonna catch me either when my foot is in this uh, sort of liminal, this, this transitional space where I'm easily uh, unsettled, or as my foot is beginning to come down and I'm sort of caught and committed into this motion. Um, and while you can certainly do all sorts of ninja stuff to try and throw your body one direction or another, by and large, it's in this moment of commitment, uh, or really any, from the time of here to here, where we are particularly vulnerable in our motion. Um, which, you know, as always, flip this, look at your training partners, see if you can start hitting them in this time and see how it changes your, uh, your, your success rate, right? And I think you'll be surprised how easy it is actually to hit, this, hit a person in this rhythm once you get over trying to uh, stare at their feet. Right, because in the beginning, right, it's like, oh, I want to hit him when he steps forward. I want to look at his feet, and there he step, and you'll be, you'll lag behind. But once you start just getting into like a, a push and pull, a flow with your partner, you know when they're coming forward. You don't have to stare at their feet. You see it. You see it before it starts to go. All the dreams, what they're going to do, bam, and you hit them in that time. Um, so play with it. Have some fun. Back to the topic. <laughs> so to uh, kind of keep ourselves from this uh, particularly slow step. And this is mostly referring to the first step that you make out of a semi-stationary position. So if I'm here and I want to bring my inertia forward, right? I want to, you know, if my body mass and I want to start shooting it somewhere, boom. That's the kind of time that we're talking about. If you're already in motion, it doesn't matter. You've got the inertia, your weight's carrying you. So we use that forward step. 
boom, to start the process, boom, right? From there, our subsequent steps are going to be much, much faster because we're not having to overcome that uh, inertia that holds us still. Because remember, inertia works both ways. It keeps you moving and it keeps you still. So uh, understanding the kind of uh, effects that has on your, your timing in combat is, uh, it's not make it or break it, but it's definitely beneficial to have a working understanding of. So we know when we're moving from a static position to a direction, we want to use the foot that's in that kind of direction. Boom. But what if we want to change our directions, right? This is something that we only have in the kata in one place, and it's sort of hidden. It's a, the, the foot transition in toroburi, right? But we're going to look at a simpler way of doing it um, in terms of just shifting your position and focal plane. So if we're walking and my momentum is going in one direction and I want to suddenly turn around, right? Most people are going to turn and they're going to move that foot, right? They're going to walk. They're like, what? Bump. The head leads the motion and then the foot responds, right? So think about where time is being spent here. You have motion, you're stopping the motion, you're turning and assessing the situation, then you're sort of orienting your body uh, to this new direction that you're trying to go to. And start to recognize each one of these as kind of a discrete chunk of time. We want to start looking at what chunks we can get rid of and what chunks we can uh, merge into one without disrupting their, their sort of natural flow. So if we're walking, this initial turn and assess is kind of the big lag point in this motion. It's that what? And the body turns towards it, right? Hypothetically, if we do this, say I'm walking this way, bah, 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 I hear something behind me, I, what? And I'm turning. By the time I've assessed it, I'm assessing it from a position where I can't easily uh, move in relation to the direction that it's coming from. Um, in other words, because we're used to orienting to things head on, if I'm interacting with something, I have the most amount of mobility in regards to the direction that I'm facing. If it's working from beside me, I have less. And from the back, I have even less. This is, uh, let's say, 60 to 70% familiarity. You know, we're just, we're not used to interacting with people behind our back or to our side. Um, the rest of it is, is biomechanical. We are built to go forward, to go along this linear motion, um, which is why we have these sort of hinged knee joints that drive us in the one direction rather than out to the side or necessarily backwards with the same kind of uh, stride length. So if looking at this, if this observation stage is where we're eating a lot of time, how can we improve that? Well, if we keep our motion and let our motion carry us through it, we cut out a lot. So instead of a stop motion, a turn motion, and an, uh, or an observed motion and then an orient motion, we take the stop and turn motion and bring them into one, right? The foot comes and then rather than stepping, stopping, turning, looking, right? We take it into a single turn. Now, this might seem like uh, the piddly and small or uh, 
or incredibly obvious to some people. But uh, again, this is a very gross example. It's very big so that you can see what we're talking about. So that we can see this sort of breakdown between one, two, three versus one. Right. Now, uh, let's look at another example um, that is a little bit more uh, subtle. So for that, take our bouquet, right? So the, the position that we're working in is that first parry, that hasuke, where we're just um, getting their sword off our line, bump, so that we can come in and strike. Now, in the beginning, of course, because this is uh, uh, not very clearly shown in the katas, it uh, people don't even know it's there. And so they, they come into Hasso and they're just making a motion, right? Then, you know, somebody explains, hey, you know, this is what this motion is. This is what we can do here. Here's how you're using it. They go, oh, and then suddenly their work changes to something like, tick, tick, right? They try and make this knocking action to come in. Knocking action isn't bad, but depending on how they do it, it can eat a lot of time. So if I'm here, and I knock back all the way to Hasso, and then I step, and then I cut. I'm stretching this time, right? I'm taking a motion that literally needs that degree of movement to cam their sword off and make me safe. Not that that's how we do it in this particular piece of work, but I'm just the raw, like, that's all the motion that's required to keep me safe from their sword. So if I take this, you know, four or five inches of cam and turn it into one, two, three, four, maybe five feet of tip movement, whoop, whoop, I'm spending so much more time than uh, I need to to accomplish my goal. Now, there are times when, uh, when you want that, right? Because you have to spend a little bit of time to get a little bit more out of your work. So for example, let's say that they're cutting straight down towards me and I think, okay, well, I'm just going to bring it up just like Hasuke. I'm gonna cam it out slightly. I'm just gonna ram this into their face. Boom, very fast, very direct, just boop. And it's done. Real good, right? If they're uh, the kind of fighter that's just driving you, right? They're a little uh, cavalier with their step distance and they're just pushing in and they, they have a feeling that they can just bully right into you. Then yeah, bump. Especially if you haven't shown them any work this tight, right? You can catch them. But what happens when the person that you're working against is... Uh, good <laughs> what if they're they're seasoned they're professional or maybe they're just cautious and they're working out right they swing you bring your sword up and and start to get into a position where you might be able to bind with it where you might be able to cam off and now all of a sudden they want to go back right or maybe they begin their own parry to work into your face right now you're dealing with a situation where on the surface it seems whoever's faster is going to win, right? But uh, uh, looks are deceiving, right? Certainly, if we have just more raw speed than them, maybe we can push it and uh, beat it. But the uh, attacker always has the disadvantage when it comes to beating a defender in terms of speed because the defender is at the center, right? They're... they're if I'm here, doot, 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 a tiny, tiny motion in my center doot, creates a large motion on the outside of that sphere, the outside of that circle, right? If their work's coming in, doot, doot, 
there again they are traveling several feet i am traveling millimeters at my core right and even out at my tip maybe a foot and a half right and again it's it's a little exaggerated so the attacker already has a disadvantage if they're uh, if they're aware of this and they're trying to create an opening into you so that they can hit you um, without that difference being important then it pays to be equally as cunning in your defensive work so perhaps they come right and now bah, i hit bah. my spine against their spine bah. and now i've done something extra right i've certainly spent more time than the little cam less time than some big hustle thing right but what have i gotten out of it right Whereas the big hustle thing doesn't really give me much except a position to make a more powerful cut from in the second motion. This creates motion, or rather it, uh, it accelerates the motion that already exists and gives it a direction that way. In other words, it extends the time that they're taking. So if I'm theoretically five feet of tip motion here, boop to boop, right? Boop to boop. And all of a sudden, my opponent does this kind of work, boop, 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 and adds two to three feet of extra mo motion, right? They're adding two to three feet of extra time traveled, which means extra time back to the center, extra time to position before I can even begin to resolve whatever work they're doing. So, uh, sometimes it's not about doing things uh, in the shortest possible span of space. Sometimes it's, most of the time, it's learning to recognize when spending your time, spending your space, will give you benefit or will cause you detriment, right? Will be good for you or will be bad for you. So, Let's look at uh, the second half of this interaction, right? We make this parry however we do it, and now it's time to cut the dude. Just like in the beginning, right? If our goal is just to bring our tip to him, right? Then it's simply a matter of distance from the tip to him. I don't have to do anything special. This is uh, almost instant, right? It's very direct very short, very hard to deal with um, sometimes, depending on how you set up the situation. But let's say that my goal is to cut him, right? And there are lots of times where you want to cut rather than to thrust, right? Um, maybe we'll make a video about that. For now, let's say that for whatever reason I've decided that I want to cut him instead of poking. Or maybe... Uh, how I've parried, how I've interacted with his sword, or how he's positioned to me, uh, makes a thrust very slow, right? Like, ooh, ooh, a, two, a two motion instead of just a one, right? If I want to cut him, how much distance does my sword have to travel to cut him meaningfully, right? Well, this is where things are a little hairy, because it depends, right? Uh, What's your goal in cutting him? You know, are you working against more than one person? Are you working against just him? Right? Are you needing... Is it enough just to clip his neck, hold him at bay, and keep him off while you move and protect yourself and just let uh, nature take its course? Or do I really need to come in here, boom, cut and reposition him as I'm bringing him in bah, to put him in front of uh, his buddy, right? Or to put him in front of an entryway 
so I can make an exit out of a different direction, right? It depends, right? Um, sometimes it depends on your range. What can you get, right? Obviously, uh, your primary goal with cutting anybody uh, in terms of the school should be to drop them, right? Just took and take them out, right? Because uh, one good cut is going to always be faster than two bad cuts, right? So you may as well just get it done right the first time. In most cases, 99% of the time, right? But sometimes you don't have the distance to do that. And you're literally just, even with your stepping, with your motion, with your setup, you cannot get deeper into their space without uh, uh, being pulled into folly, without having your fundamentals broken and making you vulnerable. Because when those times come and you're like, I can hit this dude and there's nothing he can do, um, a lot of times that's correct. Sometimes the other dude is just more cunning than you and they've set you up, right? They've suckered you in, They've lured you in with this sort of false presentation, right? And they're like, oh, just reach him just a bit more, just a bit more. Boop. And now you can't escape. Your weight's locked. Your position is locked. Your shoulders are out of balance. You can't evade and turn in any kind of precise way. They have you, right? Unless they get real sloppy and you just really ninja yourself out of the way, right? So... Sometimes light is all you can get. And sometimes you'll know that, or you should, unless they're uh, in a position where they're really actively defending themselves with their body, uh, you should be able to tell before you throw your cut, uh, before you even start to throw your cut, at what kind of range you'll be, right? And how you're going to be interacting with them. So, if I want to cut powerfully, How can I do that, right? At, at how far back does my sword have to be to build the inertia with the body motion to be able to cut meaningfully? Uh, the answer is very little, very, very little, right? If you are trying to, if all you've got is a light cut, maybe you're just the very tip of your boshi, uh, it's your uh, kisaki, your tip, right? <laughs> and you're just, you're, you're, you're nicking something, right? At the far end of your reach, right? Good reach, not bad reach. Then you can basically be on them, right? If you employ your tight sabaki, right? If you try and just, not so much, right? It's not saying that you can't hinder them, but uh, it's more a matter of luck at that point if your injury is meaningful to them. Uh, in terms of depth or severity, right? But, boah, boah, boah. I rotate. I have a feeling of expansion in my body. Pop, pop, pop. Now, if I'm on uh, maybe a harder target, Maybe what I've got, because of how they're turned, is just their clavicle, subclavian artery. This is literally not going to cut it, right? I need four inches, maybe, right? If I have a foot, all the better. Let's say that uh, my target isn't a light target, and it's not a, a semi-protected target, right? Let's say that what I want to do is I want to take them, right? Boom! Full stop end of them. 45 degrees out. Right? With tight sabaki, especially if you uh, can afford a step. Right? Bam! It's all you need for a very, uh, very serious cut to them. So, 
some of you might be asking, okay, well, you, you learn to generate this power with your body and cut so well, then why is Hasso here and not here? Right? The answer is in how they're able to interact with you and how your, uh, how you both are going to be predisposed to act according to the presence of the sword. In other words, when you're out front, when you're in Shudan, people stay further away, right? doesn't matter if they're in Shudan. When there is a sword threatening and in the space between you and your opponent, distance increases, right? Positions like Gaidon, Hasso, Wakigamai, right? These exist, because again, if I can cut the dude dead from here, why am I going to be here where I am making, you know, double the distance, double the time spent in terms of motion to get my sword to him? It's about not having something in that space. It's about uh, not being sort of not psychologically pushing your opponent away and not psychologically pushing you to expand away also, right? It's about being able to come in close. Also, right, when my sword is out here, my opponent can begin to attempt to manipulate it, right? It gives them something to uh, mess with, to play with. When I'm in Wakigamai, or Hasso, or even Gaidon, right? There's, there's nothing they can reasonably reach to play with except me. It forces them to have to work into a space where they can hit me. And once they're in that space, I can hit them, right? Because if they can reach me, I can reach them. Unless, you know, they've got a pole arm, in which case you better use your footwork and get right in. Um, Sometimes, as in uh, when we're doing the two-sword work and we put Chudon out here, we want to force them to interact with these things. We want them to be leery. We want to push them around. We want to bully them. We want to make it as uncomfortable as possible. We want to give them the feeling that there is no way they will ever come to reach us. Because everyone... Um, I can't say everyone, this is a generalization. Most people, when they think like, oh, okay, I'm gonna spar this guy who uses two swords, it'll be easy, right? It's, it's, it doesn't have two hands on it, it's gonna be weaker, I could just push him around. And they have a lot of confidence until you come to them in this chudon and they realize they can't come in. That if they wanna change their angle to, to come and cut at you uh, obliquely or from the side, they have to travel great distances around at this sort of, uh, if your center is here and your body space is here, they're orbiting even further. So they have to travel whoop, whoop, so much more compared to how much you have to travel to own the center of this circular space. Um, we're getting off kind of on a digression. The point is even though this is all we need to cut somebody very badly, very, very badly, right? We still have other positions for other reasons. Because even when we're looking at the efficiency of our technique, okay, well, if I'm doing uh, Hasuke, this is fine, right? Because we're already in the interaction. I come, I knock his sword, my sword is well past 45 degrees, so I can hit him well. Bah! And I'm behind his sword. His sword is over here. Bah, bah, and I'm working in that space. The shorter I can make that motion and have the parry be meaningful, the, the redirection be meaningful, and the cut right, bah, 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 be meaningful, the better for me. Because my success is dependent on how much time it takes him to recover 
from the cut that he made and the additional motion that I created in it, right? There, brevity is very important in the cut. But in other places, if I were to just go, I'm just gonna come and cut you, I'm just gonna come and cut you, brevity alone does not create uh, the virtue necessary to win, right? It has to be taken in the context of the relation that you're in right now with your opponent. So, this is why looking at your kata specifically is so useful because you have the context. You go, okay, the pseudo imaginary sword fight guy's gonna come, bam, and whack me. I wanna be all like, bam, and stick him in the face and push, 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 and do my thing, right? We have the context, we have the setup, we can start to look at bit by bit. Where am I moving too much? Right? Where am I moving too little? Where do I need more power into it? Right? Where do I need more interaction with them? Right? If I start to parry, he steps in to take that leg, I carry it around, rotate it up, around, take his neck, shut everything down. Right? I take a motion that should have been small and simple and I travel a great distance. But the distance that I'm spending is spent intelligently. It's spent for a purpose. It's not moving for the sake of motion. It's moving just enough to get the job done in the situation that you're in. Right? So think about it. Do your work. You know, you've got a lot of time to do your sort of solo practice. Take each piece apart. Go, okay, well, maybe I'm in Hasokata, right? Step, 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 right? They cut. When am I stepping, right? Am I stepping the moment their sword starts? If so, I'm spending, let's say, a foot of motion to evade, and they're spending so much less to retask on me, to hit me, basically making uh, my motion a waste. But if I wait a little bit, right? Ooh, now we're getting closer. When their sword gets to about here, we have about even time, right? So if they move, or if I move and they move to, uh, to evade and I have to task onto them, we move at about the same speed if I didn't already know they were going to move. If I can already tell they're going to move, then I don't have to observe the specifics of their motion. My body will take care of it. But if their movement is a surprise, I have to observe for just a split instant before my body will sort of unleash itself. Unless you've got that strike of the void down, you know, and a lot of times it just comes, right? And the more you do it, the more often it it goes and you can just really just cut from anywhere to anywhere. Um, but in a lot of ways, that kind of cut is like God. You know, when it shows up, oh, you're thankful when he's on your side, right? But you can't rely on it. You, you can't assume that it's just, oh yeah, I'm just going to magically cut from the void and, and every interaction I will win without thought, without time, at ultimate divine speed. Don't bank on it bank on good solid foundation and that will propagate that divine speed more often right so pretty even here but what if I can wait till here what if I can wait until this range between 90 and 45 degrees where I know that they are really locked into this cut where I know that they are they are just in this place they're building a ton of power right they had enough force here to kill me, and I'm letting it mature just a bit, just a bit, and I start my interaction here. Now it becomes very difficult for them to uh, meet my time, to match my time, right? So efficiency is not just about your motions. It's about when you take your motions, right? Ba, ba, ba. Cut comes, boom, and there I am, and there they are, and it's just all right here together, 
and that's the end of them, right? So, look at your work. Take your time. Um, just like we did with the initial stepping drill, break it down, right? What is it, what's happening? One step, two step, three step, a fourth step, right? Bum, bum, right? Five, six. Where can I shore it up? Where can I make those motions uh, tighter, uh, more controlled? Where can I make my time in general more controlled? And sometimes that means waiting a bit. Sometimes it means taking three things and doing them in one count. Um, or, or so near one count as to uh, be moot, basically. Like count and a quarter, time and a quarter. So, like with Tordobori. Right? In the same time it would take me to swing... I've been able to change positions and throw. How can I compress time like that? It's because of this position, right? If I was up here and tried to do this, I'd be hitting with my body and cutting in one time. And we know that as a general rule in Yoho, that is something that we do not want to do. It's uh, sloppy, it's weak, you don't hit as hard. Not that you need to hit very hard, except in situations where you really do, right? Um, but because I'm here, even though I start the motion at the same time, my footwork is finished before the cut terminates, before it completes, right? And just as we talked about in the kata application, boom, that is the application. It's not necessarily that I'm having a Seven Samurai showdown with a dude. It's a freep, right? But rather, I'm over here. Bah, 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 oop. And I take him. Right? So, think about it. Right? I think you guys, you'll either get it or you don't. <laughs> either way, um, if you want to understand this work more, you have to pick up a sword and go train. Thank you.